and we tried. So. Okay, thanks, Ravi, and uh, good to see everyone here. And I am going to be talking about joint work that I've been doing with Oliver Lorscheid. This is spread over a few different papers, including one that we have in preparation that isn't out yet. So um, that's the basic reference though, uh, is, is the, the joint papers that I have with Oliver. Um, I'm gonna start out super classical and easy and then gradually get more modern and advanced. Um, but I think most of the talk should be accessible to just about everyone, regardless of your background. Um, so here's some classical motivation. And here I mean really classical. So I want to talk briefly about Descartes' rule of signs. Okay, so probably everybody knows what this is, but just in case you missed that day of uh, high school, um, here's the rule. So suppose you have a polynomial with real coefficients. Then Descartes at its most basic, uh, in its most basic form, Descartes is the following. So it says that the number of positive real roots of uh, this polynomial f of x is at most the number of sign changes in the sequence of coefficients. Okay. And in fact, uh, these two numbers on the left and right are congruent mod two, which is also interesting, but doesn't fit as neatly into the story I'm trying to tell. So I'll sweep that part under the rug. Um, one can also talk about when equality is attained and various other things, which are all interesting, but I just want to emphasize this inequality, which I think was the one that Descartes actually um, wrote down himself was just this inequality. Um, but I'm not a historian, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, okay, so I could give an example, but I mean, I think it's clear, right? So let's, um, let's move on to something that's apparently unrelated, but feel free to ask questions if, if I'm not being clear. Um, oh yeah, I was also gonna mention, you can also, of course, get a similar bound for the number of negative real roots by replacing x by minus x. Um, and so we'll implicitly understand that we could do that as well. Okay, the next thing is uh, Newton's polygon rule. I don't know if anyone actually calls it that, but I like to call it that. Um, this is a little bit uh, more difficult to state, but not probably for this audience. So I will... Um, try to state this quickly. So F is the same as before, same notation, except now the coefficients are in some valued field K. So let's say K here is a valued field. So that means we have a valuation, which I'll assume is real valued. Um, and if valuation of zero will be plus infinity. So, we have some non-Archimedean uh, valuation on K. And what we wanna do is give an upper bound for the number of roots with a given valuation in terms of the valuations of the coefficients. And it's not quite as simple as just counting sign changes, right? So in this case, what we need to do is look at the Newton polygon of F, which is, um, the lower convex hull of the set of points, I comma valuation of AI. And so for example, um, let me just do a really simple example here. Right, so perhaps your, um, zeroth coefficient valuation of A zero is two and valuation of A one is one and valuation of A zero is zero. Then the lower convex hull looks like this. Wait, Matt, that can that second A zero be an A two? A's, oh yeah, thank you. Oh wait, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Libby. Okay. So, um, so in this case, we just get one segment. And um, so we have one slope. The slope here is negative one. We'll actually be interested in minus the slope, which is plus one. And the multiplicity is two, because if you project to the x-axis, this has a horizontal length of two. Um, you can see that if I change the coefficients a bit, uh, for example, if the valuation of a one is now zero instead of one, um, then all of a sudden we get two segments, one with slope um, minus a half and one with slope zero. And, and so again, you can say something about, um, well, this will turn out to say something about the valuations of the roots of the polynomial. So here's the theorem. The theorem is that, whoops. So I suppose this is due to Newton in some form similar to this. The number of roots of valuation S is less than or equal to the multiplicity of minus S in the Newton polygon of F. Where again, by multiplicity, I mean that length of the projection to the x-axis. So what I wanna just comment on briefly is, is the analogy between these two results. In both cases, um, we have a mapping on some field uh, first case, real numbers, second case, a non-Archimedean field. And we're asking for a bound on the number of roots with some given property in terms of um, either the signs or the valuations of the coefficients. And what I'd like to explain is that there's a common generalization of these two inequalities that holds in quite a general situation. And that this general situation is also extremely useful for understanding results in the theory of matroids, which will be sort of the second half of the talk. Um, and the common algebraic structure in which we will unify all these things is what Oliver and I call a pasture, which is named because it's a generalization of a field. Um, and so I'm gonna define pastures now. In fact, we have another kind of um, generalization of fields that's even more general called tracts. And so I wanted to find that first, and then we'll focus mainly on pastures, though. So section two is uh, tracts and pastures. And my goal here is to communicate the definition and also to convince you that this is a natural uh, and, and interesting definition. So the idea is that, um, so pastures are special kinds of tracts, okay? and fields are very special kinds of pastures. The idea is we're going to relax the assumption that addition comes from a binary operation. We're gonna let go of that. Um, we will still assume multiplication arises from a binary operation, uh, but addition we're gonna be more laid back about. Before I give you the axioms, because they're a little bit, um, you know, there's, I don't know, axiomatic algebra is always a little bit dull. So let me give you two examples first without telling you um, what they're examples of exactly, and, and then we'll state the formal axioms. So the first example is what's called the Krasner hyperfield. This is what Alan Kahn and Katerina Kansani um, named it anyway, and I'll use their letter for it, which is boldface K. Um, so as a set, it consists of two elements called zero and one. And um, we have the usual multiplication. Okay, it's a binary operation. Um, instead of having an additive op uh, binary operation though, we just have a notion of additive relations. So what do I mean? Um, we have, for example, zero plus X is always equal to X. Okay, that's an additive relation. 
uh, for x equals zero or one. We also have one plus one is equal to one in this structure. And we also have one plus one is equal to zero. Those are both valid additive relations. Okay, so um, obviously this is not coming from a binary relation, but we don't care. One plus one is one and one plus one is zero are both true statements. And that's the basic thing to keep in mind. Um, there are longer relations that involve more than three terms as well. But as you'll see, part of the axiom for a pasture is that the three term additive relations generate all the additive relations. And um, these are all the three term relations here. Okay, so that's the first example. The second example, which is complementary in some sense is what we call the regular partial field. And somewhat suggestively, we, we denote this as F1 plus or minus, sort of like the field with one element, but in addition, we also have a, a negative one element instead of um, field of one element would usually have two elements, <laughs> zero and one. And this also has a minus one. Um, so again, that, that's fancier than what it really is. Um, as a set, it consists of zero, one, and minus one. And again, we have the usual multiplication. So a theme you'll see here is we're typically not doing anything interesting with multiplication, nothing Actually, different. Matt, Matt I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just, I don't know if it's worth interrupting. This is very, F1 is all perplexing, but what's more perplexing is you said F1 has two elements usually, but which also seems weird, but now this is, uh, so you, maybe I should just, I don't even have a question. I'm just bewildered by this. By this. Um, well, um, so of course there's many different interpretations of what F1 is and different contexts in which you can try to define that. Um, from Oliver Lorscheid's point of view of ordered blueprints, uh, F1 has an underlying um, multiplicative monoid, which is the usual monoid with zero and one and multiplication. This monoid has a minus one as well. So that, that's what I mean here. I mean, why that's called the field with one element, that, that's a separate thing that I won't try to say anything intelligent about right now. But it, it fits into various F1 um, stories. Great. Okay. Um, so this F1 plus or minus is um, as a set and a, as a multiplicative monoid is, is, an, is a familiar thing. Uh, what are the additive relations? Well, um, they're generated by, let's say, Again, zero plus X is always equal to X, no matter what X is. And then one plus minus one is equal to zero. Seems pretty reasonable. But what you're supposed to notice here, so remark, there's no relation of the form one plus one is equal to something, for example. Right, so one plus one, if you like, is undefined in this structure. So there's two reasons that our additive relations can fail to come from a binary operation. One is that they might be multi-valued in some sense, and the other is that they might be undefined. Okay. So to capture this, it, it's annoying to try to talk about multi-valued or undefined binary operations. Uh, so let's instead take the following axiomatic approach. <clears throat> so here's the definition of a tract. And again, feel free to interrupt if there's any questions. Um, I just have a ton of material to cover, so I'm gonna to try to do the boring stuff quickly. So a tract is a multiplicative monoid with zero, F, such that F star is, which is F minus uh, the zero element is an abelian group. Okay, zero, monoid with zero means zero is supposed to be in a, multiplicatively absorbing element here, but maybe I'll write that as one of the axioms in case that's ambiguous. Um, we have an involution, x goes to minus x on f, um, fixing zero. And then the interesting thing is we have this subset <coughs> encoding the additive relations. So a subset, N sub F, think of these as the null 
the, it's the null set of the, of the tract. So it uh, encodes the additive relations which are considered null. So a subset NF of, of what? Well, it's of this group semi-ring natural numbers adjoin F star. It's you consider elements of the multiplicative group F star with natural number, formal linear combinations with natural number coefficients. That naturally forms a semi-ring. And then um, we have some axioms that this subset of additive expressions should satisfy. And um, here they are. Move that off to the side. So first of all, zero should be in the null set and one should not be in the null set just to avoid trivialities. Um, this is like for uh, commutative rings requiring that one is not equal to zero. But here by zero, I mean, you know, the empty expression. I mean, it's the zero element of the group semi-ring. So um, it's the kind of empty combination of the elements of F star. And by one, I mean the multiplicative identity of the group semi-ring. So that is like the natural number one times the identi identity element of the group F star. Um, do the natural numbers contain zero? <laughs> yeah. Yes, for me, they do. Um, and so you do want to identify here um, all zero. So zero times an element of the group should be identified with the zero element of, yeah, of the, of the semi-ring. Thanks. Um, so zero times x equals x times zero equals zero. I mentioned that axiom before. The next one is that if x is an element of f and alpha is in the null set, then x times alpha should be in the null set. So multiplying a null expression by a scalar, right, it should still be null, seems reasonable. And finally, um, for x, y, and f, Uh, x plus y is null if and only if y is equal to negative x. So the involution encodes the two term null expressions, right? So x plus y is null if and only if y is minus x. And um, that's it. Those are the axioms for a track. So it's very minimalistic in, in a certain sense. I'm confused um, about three. Okay. Um, should, should it be X is an F star? Well, yeah, but the zero element is null also by assumption. So okay, um, yeah, okay, yeah. it doesn't matter. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. But in practice, um, it's more interesting when X is an F star. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so that's uh, what attract is. Don't worry, I'll give some examples uh, soon, but. Um, then let me tell you what a pasture is. It's actually, it's gonna do it on one slide, but I probably need to go to the next one. So a tract is called a pasture if um, we have one more axiom, which I call the fusion rule. So this says the following, for alpha and beta in this uh, group semi-ring. So I'll try to use Greek letters for the elements of the group semi-ring, which are additive formal expressions and like Roman letters for elements of F just to keep those, those straight. Um, <laughs> alpha plus beta is null if and only if there exists some element of F such that alpha plus X is null and beta minus X is null. Okay. So this says two, two interesting things. One is that if you have alpha plus a single element, remember alpha is a 
a formal sum of possibly several things. And you add one more element of the group to it. And then you have beta, which is another formal sum and you subtract the same element X, then you can kind of fuse them together and cancel out the Xs, cancel the X and minus X. This is interesting because we're in a semi-ring, right? So X plus negative X is not zero, so to speak, automatically. Um, you know, this is this familiar issue in tropical geometry and other, other parts of mathematics where you're working in some setting where you don't have additive inverses. And so you have to be very thoughtful about how you treat them. So this is a way to get some kind of additive inverses without having like a really strong version of that that would just kill everything you're trying to do. But conversely, you can go backwards and you can decompose long expressions uh, that are in the null set into shorter ones. And this allows you to basically inductively reduce various statements about the null set of a pasture to just three term additive relations, which are the closest ones to binary operations, right? Because binary, you know, in a field, you can talk about whether a sum of 17 elements is zero or not, but the field itself is determined by just the three term additive relations of the form X plus Y is equal to Z. Um, so that's what we're trying to mimic here. Um, so probably some examples are, are in order. But yeah, as I just kind of said in words, a pasture is determined. I think, uh, Matt, I think there's a question from Nicholas Kuhn. OK. Go ahead. Um, I guess what, uh, I guess I forgot what axiom 4 was as a question. That's not a question. Right. Um, so it was axiom four was this uh, thing that the involution. Okay, so x, x plus four. minus x is in the null set, right? And then with. It's in the null set, but it's not zero. But it, it's not zero, okay. Yeah. Right. right, so the tricky thing is here, you have to think of some things as being like zero, but they're not literally equal to zero. <laughs> So. And sorry, from what you said earlier, the idea is that the expression a plus b equals c means that a plus b plus negative c is in the null set? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I, in fact, I didn't say that, but I, it's good that I implied it enough that you said that. So, um, so just a notation, if I ever write uh, a plus b equals c in a pasture, that really means that a plus b minus c uh, is in the null set, which really means a plus b plus the in, involution of c is in the null set. Yeah, so there's various shorthands that don't actually cause any problems. Um, thanks. So I'll try to use the null set terminology to keep things from being too ambiguous, but sometimes you just really want to write equals zero. <laughs> um, so in some parts of algebra, right, we would just mod out by the null things like in commutative rings. And if you have an ideal that should be considered null, you just look at R mod I, and that's again a ring. But the problem here is with other, you know, algebraic structures is that it, it doesn't quite work to, um, to kind of mod out and you, um, it's better to just keep track of the, the null elements and not talk about quotients, at least not in the, not yet. So <clears throat> some examples. Okay, so clearly, hopefully from what I've said, you can see that every field is in particular a pasture, right, where a sort of summation ai xi is null if and only if it's actually equal to zero. Okay. Now a more interesting example would be you could take k to be a field and g to be a multiplicative subgroup of k star. Okay, and now you can look at the quotient k mod g. Or if you like, you can think of that as the group K star mod G together with zero. And that's a multiplicative monoid. But now we wanna know what are the uh, additive relations. And you do essentially the only thing you could reasonably do here, which is you say um, that an expression is null. So here the AIs are supposed to be natural numbers and 
excise, let's say, or, you know, post-set representatives. Um, if and only if there exists some um, GIs in the group that you're modding out by, such that the sum AI GI XI is zero in K. Right. And so this, um, this is a pasture and it's a particular kind of pasture called a hyperfield. Well, this is also a particular kind of hyperfield. Not every hyperfield arises as a quotient of a, of a field in this way. But the examples we'll be interested in today will have this form. So I don't need to define hyperfields in, in general for you. Um, so here's some sub examples of that in case that's too abstract. The first example is you could take, uh, well, that Krasner hyperfield I mentioned before, you could realize as, let's say, R mod R star, or in fact, any um, field that's not the field of two elements mod um, its multiplicative subgroup. Uh, and then you have another example, which is the sine hyperfield is R mod the positive reals. This is called the sine hyperfield, and this will come up in just a moment when we get back to Descartes' rule of signs. Okay. So here, essentially though, you're just forgetting what you're, tr the idea here is you're forgetting whether the magnitude of a real number, just remembering whether it's zero or positive or negative. And then you wanna know what can you say about addition? If you only know about the signs of real numbers, what can you say about the sign of their sum? And this, the additive structure here encodes exactly that, okay? So for example, one plus one plus one is not null, right? Because it's, whoops, yes, it's impossible for a sum of three positive numbers to be zero, but one plus one plus negative one is null. All right, and then example 2C is the tropical hyperfield. This is more or less how I got interested in all of these things because I find some of the ways tropical geometry is done to be unnatural and not, um, not a seemingly the right way to do things. And so instead of the max plus or min plus semi ring, which to me doesn't have enough structure in it, I prefer to look at the tropical numbers as a hyperfield or in this case as a pasture, where if we're using additive notation, then we take the real numbers together with plus infinity and our multiplication is the usual addition. I know that's annoying, but um, it's more consistent with um, tropical geometry notation, but you can write this all multiplicatively, which looks more natural if you want. Um, and then, uh, well, we don't really have an addition as an operation, but what, when is A plus B plus C in the null set where A, B, C are extended real numbers? And then you could extrapolate to more than three things if you want. Well, this is if and only if the minimum of A, B, and C is achieved at least twice, which is a condition that one sees a lot in tropical things. And What's nice about this way of looking at it, I mean, it looks like I just picked that out of nowhere, but in fact, this is an example of the previous construction because this you can view this as K mod K zero, where K is any valued field. Well, okay, let's say the value group is all of the reals and K zero denotes the elements of uh, valuation zero. And this arises as a quotient hyperfield in this way. So it's exactly recording the arithmetic of valuations. What do we know about the valuation of a sum of two things if we only know the valuations of those two things? Well, we know it's greater than or equal to the minimum and um, equal to the minimum if the two things are different and you can encode that in, in this way. So any questions about those examples? All right, then let's move on. So the next kind of example I wanna look at are what are called partial fields. 
these are very common in matroid theory, not so much in algebraic geometry or arithmetic geometry, but um, they're pretty interesting. And the general setup is like this. So you have a commutative ring R, all right? And um, <clears throat> now you look at F, which is G together with zero. Uh, oh, so G is a subgroup of the, multi of, the, of the unit group of R, and it contains minus one by assumption. And now you add zero to this uh, multiplicative subgroup, and this satisfies the axioms of a pasture. Uh, where x plus y plus z is null if and only if the sum is actually zero in the ambient ring. But the point is we restrict our elements to this uh, subgroup of, of, F, of R star. Um, so the point is that in a hyperfield, uh, basically, there's at most one element z so that x plus y plus z is null for any given, for any fixed x and y. Uh, sorry, in a partial field, there's at most one z, and in a hyperfield, there's at least one such z. Uh, and in a field, there's exactly one z such that x plus y plus z is, is null. So these are sort of opposite cases of, of this. And to give you some examples of, of partial fields, here's some notation. If R is a commutative ring, P of R will denote um, the partial field associated to the, the full unit group. Okay, so G, just take G to be all of R star. And then some interesting examples of this that actually come up in, in matroid theory are, first of all, this regular partial field that we saw before. F1 plus or minus is just the partial field associated to Z. I'll leave that as an exercise. Um, the next example, this will show up at the end of the talk if I, if I keep moving along at a healthy pace anyway. Um, it's called the dyadic partial field and it's associated to Z adjoin one half. Um, you also have the hexagonal partial field which is associated to Z adjoin a sixth root of unity. And like I said, these are not just arbitrary examples, but they'll show up in one of the theorems at the end of the talk. And the last one looks funny, but it's supposed to remind you of the theory of cross ratios because that's where it comes from. And it's Z adjoin T one over T and one over one minus T where T is an indeterminate. So you take the unit group of that ring and uh, you restrict your, your elements to things that live there. Uh, and you look at the additive relations among such units. And um, this somehow mimics the theory of cross ratios in, in, algebra, in projective geometry. <clears throat> okay, but before I get to all that, I need to clean up uh, the tie-in with this discussion with um, Descartes' rule. So any questions so far about this plethora of examples. Okay, cool. So I should say, if, I hope there's not a test at the end because I'm not going to remember <laughs> them all. But if you're, so you'll remind us when you. Uh, yeah, I'll you, try to quickly go back and, and remind you of these. I, ju I just want you to know they're like simple, concrete things that are, are like reasonably natural to, to write down. I have some stupid questions. Sure. That's okay. Um, so in the tropical hyperfield, Mm -hmm. um, if you can go back to that, maybe. So the additive inverse of R is like R itself, right? That's correct. Yeah, exactly. But then shouldn't R plus R be equal to zero? Uh, yeah, so R plus R is null. Is in there, okay. And that's correct because the minimum is achieved twice there, right? Yeah. Mm, okay, but that doesn't mean it's like R plus R equals zero. Yeah, true. it's not zero, it's just no. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Oh, all right. Wait, is it not fair to say that R plus R is infinity? Uh, right, that's like... not that's not uh, the way I want to think about it. It's okay. not a binary operation. Sure. Yeah. 
I guess R plus so, R can be equal to anything between R and infinity. Yes, yeah, so if you insist on thinking of it as a, a multi-valued operation, then it would be anything greater than or equal to R, including plus infinity. Uh, and that would be the traditional hyperfield perspective. But you know, I prefer to now think of it in this way, that it's simply a null expression. Um, and then in the theory of blueprints, which I'm not going to get to, there one can introduce a certain partial order that encodes this. But um, yeah, I don't need to do that for this talk. Sorry, could I could I ask why? It, it's psychologically much easier for me to think of addition as a bilinear, multi-valued, or possibly zero-valued operation rather than this null set stuff. At least for pastors, what what problems do I get into if I think that way? Yeah, I mean, um. Or, or why do you prefer, you know? Not, right. I mean, I, I was hoping that would be clear by the end of the talk. It might or might not be. So I can try to answer quickly yeah, now. No, I, I mean, quit. yeah, it's, I, I'll just say that I, I felt that way too at first. And um, the reason I have changed my mind is somehow that um, it, it leads, so for example, hyperfields have an associativity axiom uh, in, and for our purposes, it turns out to be completely irrelevant. So when you write things this way in terms of the null set, you know, associativity is not really natural. So um, you don't even worry about it. But if you try to think of it as a generalized binary operation, you might want it to be associative, but it turns out that's just kind of a psychological red herring. So that's one, one example. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you quickly what a homomorphism is. Um, and this, I apologize. I mean, I've packed so much into this talk. Um, you know, it's really like two talks that I'm trying to squeeze into one. So, um, you know, if I don't get as far as I wanted, that's fine too, but um, I'm gonna to try to go through this part a little quickly just so I can get to something kind of striking and, and non unexpected. Um, so homomorphism is basically what you think it is, right? So it's a multiplicative map preserving all the visible structure. So, um, so preserving zero and one and minus one and taking the null set um, of F1 to the null set of F2, right? That's all it is. So one example of this is the sign map real number to the sign hyperfield um, is a homomorphism of pastures. And another example is evaluation from a field to the tropical hyperfield is a homomorphism, right? And so um, this is interesting because, I don't know, in, in multiple contexts, it's occurred to me that signs of real numbers are somehow like valuations but a bit different. And I was never quite sure how to make that precise, but this makes that completely precise. They're both homomorphisms in this category. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, this is of course, sort of how I'm gonna tie together Descartes' rule and Newton's rule. Um, so pastures form a category. It, the initial object in this category is F1 plus or minus. The final object in this category of pastures is the Krasner hyperfield. So this clears up another little confusion in that, I don't know, when I was first getting started here, I, I would sort of think of K, the Krasner hyperfield as F1, the, the field of one element, and, and somehow that's just wrong um, when, when you start thinking more carefully um, because F1 is more of like a final, uh, sorry, initial object in this world, except here we're requiring this involution x goes to minus x and we want this element called minus one. So I really have to augment F1. But anyway, Krasner should be thought of as a final object, not an initial object. Um, we also, in this category, we have arbitrary um, limits and co-limits. All right, maybe I'm supposed to add the word small there or something, but I, I have, I, I'm not interested right now in, in the set theory. So, um, we, we have, in particular, we have um, products and, and tensor products of pastures. And notice, although I guess this is obvious to everyone, that 
even in fields, we lack that. So in some sense, this is a nice extension of the category of fields in that we can take arbitrary products and tensor products of pastures and still get pastures, even though they're field-like in that every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So it, it's, you know, it's nice in a certain way. Um, okay. So that's all the category theory I'll say for now. Uh, we can talk about polynomials over pastures. This is the part I'm gonna try to treat really quickly because um, it's actually a little bit complicated. This is another reason why the theory of hyperfields is just, in, or hyper rings more generally is, is insufficient because um, it's, it's quite a nightmare when you try to deal with free objects like polynomial rings. Um, the axioms for hyper rings just don't fit this very well. But um, one can do this, so one can make sense of P of X. If P is a pasture, then PX is what we call an ordered blueprint. I'm not gonna define what that is, unfortunately, but um, right now you could just think of it as a set. <laughs> and, um, if you're interested, you can read more about what additional algebraic structure it has. But I'll just say right now, think of an element here um, as a formal expression. You know, it's just a zero plus a one x plus a n x to the n, where the a i's are in p. Okay, and I claim that we can make sense of roots of polynomials. So R is a root of f of x, um, if and only if, well, when you plug in R, it's null. <laughs> so summation AI R to the I is null. And, um, the reason, one of the main reasons for introducing pastures as opposed to just tracts is because of the following. We have a division theorem, division algorithm. So I could say that X minus R divides F of X if and only if there's some G of X equal to some B I X to the I equals one to N minus one, sorry, zero such that, well, such that what? So, so that if you multiplied out X minus R by G of X and you multiplied that coefficient wise and wrote it out and then compared with F of X and subtracted every, each coefficient of that would be null. So what that comes that down to is saying that AI plus R times BI minus BI minus one should be null for all I equals zero up to N with some obvious conventions that B sub minus one and B sub N are, are supposed to be zero here. So this is just encoding what, I mean, in a, it, over field, this would be equivalent to the usual definition. But this makes sense now over any pasture because it's just a three term additive relation, which is or is not null. And so the, um, the lemma that Oliver and I discovered is that R is a root of F of X in the first sense, if and only if X minus R divides F of X. And um, this really uses the fusion rule in the proof. You have to sort of reduce to the, you have to know that all additive relations can be reduced to three term relations. So um, one really needs pastures, not just tracks to make this work. Okay. Sorry, uh, all the examples you gave us originally were of pastures, right? So Correct, right. yeah, that's right. Everything I've told you about um, is actually a pasture. Great. Does anybody care about tracks or is that just along the way to defining pastures? It's along the way to defining pastures and also some of our results about matroids hold over arbitrary tracks. And so we state them in that generality because that's the natural place where it holds. But I'm pointing out one reason you might want this fusion rule is, is here. Gotcha. If you want to talk about polynomials, then gotcha. yeah, it's useful. Um, are, there, are there any natural examples of tracks, not pastures? Not that I know of really. Yeah. I mean, 
it depends on what you mean by natural, but yeah, I mean, really, no, I don't find them that useful. So um, I tend to focus on, on pastures as, as the more important category. Um, okay. Yep. So, so uh, yep. sorry, you, a polynomial can have many roots, I guess? Right. More than a degree, I guess. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct. It can. Okay. In, in nice cases, it, that doesn't happen. Um, but uh, yeah, it's actually sort of an open problem to uh, say what nice means in that context. So um, yeah, you could even have infinitely many roots, in fact, for a um, polynomial. Uh, but um, there's a notion of multiplicity, which is bounded by the degree for an individual root, right? So suppose R is in P. Um, so if R is not a root, then we'll say that its multiplicity is zero. And otherwise, what we define it inductively. So we define the multiplicity of R as a root of F to be one plus the maximum of the multiplicities of G, where G <coughs> is overall, I'll just write G as above. It's sort of all quotients of F by X minus R. So what I didn't say, but maybe implied, is that the quotients are not unique here, like they are over a field. So there's a division algorithm of sorts, but you can have different quotients. So you have different choices of G, and you just pick the one that gives the biggest multiplicity. And that inductively defines the multiplicity of any root. Uh, but because the degree is going down by one each time, the multiplicity is bounded by the degree for an individual root. Um, and so the lemma that, another lemma that we prove is that if you have a homomorphism and for simplicity, I'll just say it's from a field to a pasture, but one can be a little more general here. Uh, and now you have a polynomial with coefficients in the field. Then for every element, let me call it little s, in my pasture, we can compare the multiplicity of S as a root of phi of F. So phi of F just means apply phi coefficient wise. It's greater than or equal to the sum over all elements in the inverse image of the multiplicity of R as a root of F. Okay. So the in some sense, there's, um, there's a bound that's just completely general. This is any homomorphism in this category of pastures. And so the first punchline of the talk is that in some cases, we can explicitly compute these multiplicities. I mean, they're defined in some weird inductive way. But in a concrete situation, you might be able to give a formula so if F has coefficients in the sine hyperfield, then you can look at the multiplicity of one, which represents all positive numbers, all positive reals, as a root of F. And it's just the number of sign changes in the coefficients of F. Um, and so this, together with that inequality, gives us Descartes' rule. And if F has coefficients in the tropical hyperfield, then the multiplicity in this purely formally algebraic inductive way of S as a root of F is exactly the multiplicity of minus S in the Newton polygon of F. And that gives us the theory of Newton polygons. So in this sense, we have a unification of Descartes' rule and Newton's rule. And uh, in fact, my student, Trevor Gunn, has proved a, a simultaneous generalization. You can work over something called the real tropical hyperfield, where you sort of keep track of signs as in addition to valuations, and then you get a mixture of these two rules. But I'm not going to try to state that formally now. The thing he's actually working on right now, which seems to be pretty challenging, but it's uh, interesting in my opinion, uh, so I'll just say open problem is to do this for um, 
multivariate polynomials. So try to define multiplicities for say n polynomials and n variables. And what would the multiplicity of an isolated point of the intersection be? And the cool thing is that tropically, we kind of know what the answer is. It's some mixed volume of Newton polytopes of something. And tropical intersection theory is rather well developed. But over the sine hyperfield, it's an open problem. We don't know what Descartes' rule of signs should say for multivariate polynomials. And so I think this analogy is worth pursuing because we can import tools from tropical intersection theory, hopefully into um, other realms where we don't actually know how to do things. So that's so, what so my you, student is working on now. So you mean there's no Kovansky-esque type thing that deals with uh, Newton polytopes with rational, <clears throat> with rational coefficients? You mean with like real sign coefficients? Yes, right. Yes, exactly. What you do? Yeah, there's special cases of this are known, but no general theory. That's neat. Yeah. So um, we we at least have hopes of recovering the known results along these lines in this more kind of abstract, unified way. Um, whether we'll get something genuinely new, I hope so, but you know, not yet. Um. Okay, so I totally misjudged the time that this talk would take, uh, which I apologize for. I've given this before using slides where I just, you know, go through the Beamer slides quickly. And I, I didn't want to do that because I prefer not to. But the reason I use slides, I guess, is because this is what happens when you don't. So let me, um, let me just like give you an impressionistic picture of how this fits into matroids without being really precise. And I'll, I'll do this as, fat, as sort of quickly as I can. And then if people want to stay and ask questions, I'll stay later and make this more precise. But um, I'm also going to give a talk at ICERM in a couple of weeks where I'm actually focusing on the second half of this talk that you're almost not getting here. Um, but let me tell you what, just give you a preview of that. <clears throat> so um, a matroid, I suppose if, if in five minutes, I can't say anything useful that if you haven't already seen it will be meaningful, but let me just give you a perspective that you might not have right now. A matroid is a combinatorial analog of a subspace of a vector space. So, um, so we have a notion if P is any pasture or even more generally a tract, but let's stick to pastures. Um, we can talk about matroids over P. And this has the, the following property. So if P is field, uh, field F, let's say, then um, an F matroid, and let's be specific here, of rank R on the set, which is just the number from one to N for concreteness. So an F matroid of rank R on the set is just an R-dimensional subspace of um, the set one through n. Or, sorry, sorry, sorry. Of, um, of f to the n. I mean, when we're doing linear algebra, we like to be coordinate free and not um, choose a basis of the vector space. But in fact, when you want to get the analogy with matroids, you kind of have to choose coordinates because matroids are somehow coordinate dependent in a way that vector subspaces aren't. Um, so if P is a field, it's just a subspace of rank R. And if P is um, the Krasner hyperfield, a K matroid um, is just a matroid. So it makes this more than an analogy. It's actually matroids and subspaces are special cases of the same general construction. So what Oliver and I have done is we define something we write as M mat Rn, the matroid space of um, rank R on an N element set. And if you like, you can think of this as a functor from pastures to sets, which uh, takes a pasture P to the set of uh, P matroids of rank R on the set one through N. 
Um, and any algebraic geometer worth his or her salt, uh, and several people on this Zoom call are definitely worth their salt, um, would ask if this functor is representable in, in, in some sense. And, um, and it is. And we have an 85 page paper to prove it, um, which I, I'm obviously not going to give all the details of. But um, in fact, this, uh, this functor is representable by an ordered blue scheme. So in some fancy um, abstract world that I haven't quite told you about, but it, it's like a ring version of pastures, basically, if you want to think of it that way. Pastures are field-like objects, and you can ask what the ring-like objects are. Those are more or less these kind of ordered blueprints. And then um, you can build algebraic geometry based on those objects as your local building blocks, and you can represent the functor. And how do you do it? It's very easy. You write down the Pluker equations for the Grossmannian, and you interpret them in this more general language. Um, and that's more or less all you do. Um, you just have to say various complicated things to make that precise. Um, and so uh, that's part of what we're doing is, is just that. But the last part that I wanna explain, uh, and I'll do this like really quickly because I'm out of time, is just to tell you, this actually has applications to matroid theory and combinatorics. It's not just like doing algebra for its own sake you get really short, incisive uh, category theoretic proofs of things that matroid theorists write down with their bare hands and they take many pages of calculations. And I find this quite exciting. Um, uh, I'm not sure if every combinatorialist finds it as exciting as I do, but um, here's the basic idea. Uh, we can look at um, sort of all solutions to the, well, we can look at all P matroids, which are some solutions to the Pluker equations. And um, so that's that's a functor again. So P, so let's say we fix M, we fix a matroid M. And now um, we look at a functor from pastures to sets where um, P goes to the, uh, the set of P matroids with support M. So what I mean by that is that, you know, if you have a Pluker vector, you can just look at whether each coordinate is zero or non-zero. And that gives you some subset of the set of coordinates. And uh, it makes sense to ask if those are the bases of a matroid or not. And, um, or if you like, just take the push forward to the Krasner hyperfield because it's the final object and there's a map from P to K and you can make sense of uh, the, the support. So this functor here, um, it turns out it is also representable. And there's a certain equivalence relation I won't get into because I'm already over time, uh, but it's, it's easier to look at an equivalence class of, of P matroids. And this functor is representable by a pasture which we denote by F sub M called the foundation of M. If you can compute the foundations of matroids or classify them or say things about them, then it tells you about in particular, every field over which that matroid is representable because fields are pastures. And you know this is representing the functor of all representations of the matroids over all pastures, including fields. And so, um, I will just conclude with a category theoretic proof of a theorem of Tat, which has a not super simple uh, proof in matroid theory, which is that um, a matroid is, is regular, which means sort of representable by a unimodular matrix over Z, um, if and only if it's representable over every field which means sort of comes from a matrix over each, each field, if and only if it's representable over uh, the field of two elements and the field of three elements. All right, so these are the random kind of things you'll see in matroid theory. They're like 
thousands of theorems of this type. And many of these we can prove by pure thought now. So here's how you do it in this case. So proof, um, regular means almost by definition, when you think about it, um, representable over the partial the regular partial field, F1 plus or minus. I didn't say enough to um, prove that, but it's, it's almost by definition. And then, um, but the product of F2 and F3 in the category of pastures turns out to be F1 plus or minus, which is just almost a pure thought calculation. And so the fact that this functor is representable, right? So hom um, of the foundation of M into F2 cross F3 is the product of the homs <laughs> by the universal property of products. And, the, and then that's the proof. <laughs> so, you know, the, the alternative in matroid theory would be to write down some matrices and you do some pivoting operations that, you know, Gaussian elimination and you do various things that take a, a few pages of work. Um, so somehow we have many proofs like this 